Do you all remember this? Uh, if you don't, I think most of you viewers would, but if you don't know what this is, this is a magic rectangle that actually contains some tape inside that has music on it. This is how we used to listen to music back in the olden dates. Is that amazing or what? This thing was a big part of me learning and remembering tunes, which is what we're talking about today. You know, so often we're talking about how to play, but not necessarily what to play. So I wanted to spend some time just talking today about how to learn and remember tunes to add to your repertoire. Let's check it out. Welcome to Learn Jazz Bass with Matt Rubicki. Uh, you know what to do, like, subscribe, look for a PDF below. So as I said, we're talking about repertoire today and I wanted to make a couple points at the very beginning. And that is that if you want to increase your repertoire, you have to make it a priority in your daily practice. And by that, I mean devote consistent time in your practice schedule to working on repertoire stuff. It's gonna help a lot. And if you're interested in doing that, I would recommend a system that I sort of came up with. It's very simple, but I want to talk about it in a little more detail now. The first thing we're going to talk about is assembling our materials or, or our assets of the tunes we're going to find. So in the olden days, not only was I using cassette tapes, but I was also using a physical binder with actual paper that I would have to put a, a, a holes in with a three hole punch and, you know, have reinforcers on them because you would be turning the pages all the time and pages would rip. I would have to use that and a cassette tape to actually keep things organized as well as a written out list. While the specifics of how those elements are manifested in today's world, the basic idea remains the same. We want to have two lists and you can do that digitally, of course. You wanna have copies of the printed music. Of course, you can do that digitally. And you wanna have a playlist of recordings. Again, you can do that digitally. Welcome to the new world, right? So the main two things are the recordings and the charts themselves. And sort of go going along with that is an, an updated list. And you wanna keep all these things synchronized. In other words, when you add a tune, you're gonna add it to the list of tunes that you know, you're gonna add it to your playlist of recordings, and you're gonna add it to your proverbial binder, whether that's physical or digital. So you're assembling charts for your proverbial binder, and how do you know which charts to get? What tunes are you gonna pick from? Well, certainly, of course, whatever you wanna learn is, is a good place to start, but um, I'll include a list of uh, standards that I think are important in the PDF below. And also, of course, you can find other people's lists. There's a lot of crossover for a lot of folks, um, but I will put that in the PDF and I will also try to mark where I can um, definitive recordings of certain tunes. And we'll talk about that a little more in a second. But also importantly, if you go to jam sessions, which I really recommend that you do, and there are tunes that are called that you don't know, those should be a very, very high priority on your list as to the next thing to learn. If somebody calls Blue Bossa and you don't know it, that should be the very next tune that you learn. So as I said, you wanna have two lists. The one is a list of tunes that you already know and try to keep that organized, try to keep it alphabetized. But you should also have a list of the songs that you need to learn, that you wanna learn. And what you're gonna be doing is obviously moving one at a time, one song from what you need to learn into the tunes that you do know. You want to have a variety of styles too, if possible. Bosses and waltzes and Thelonious Monk tunes and bebop tunes and all kinds of blueses and so on and so forth. Don't just learn medium swing, you know, standards. So for the recordings, you want to find as definitive a version as possible. And sometimes that's not really quite as possible as we would like. For example, on the old sort of American songbook standards, there are thousands of versions of Body and Soul. So it's been done many, many ways. So sometimes you can't find one single recording that is definitive. But that said, try to find something that you really like, something that has good quality, and um, will be inspiring for you to play along with and study. Also get multiple versions, and along that line, get multiple versions, especially of songs that have lyrics. So generally this is, again, American songbook tunes, Gershwin and Cole Porter and so on. And you wanna be able to also know what the lyrics are. So you want a copy of the lyrics, and you also wanna get a vocal version, a vocal recording of that. That's gonna force you to play in other keys, and it's gonna help you to really be able to sort of identify with the song and 
and learn it faster when you know the lyrics and when you hear somebody actually singing the melody. Now for the charts themselves, I personally use an app called Fourscore on my iPad to keep my PDFs organized, but it's certainly you don't have to do that. And you can use a physical binder, of course, with actual paper. That's great, and it got me very far. Um, at this point, I've got enough tunes that it's sort of unwieldy to, in fact, I had to have two binders to keep all the tunes because I also had multiple charts of some of the songs. So if there was something that was vastly different from one version to another, I might keep two pieces of paper, one for each version, of the particular song that I've learned. And again, you wanna keep this organized in the same way that you keep your list organized. Alphabetically is the simplest thing and that's what I try to do. But there's a couple things to note about having printed music. The first is that very, very, very often in the older charts that we have from the original real book and from some Abersol charts and so on, there's a lot of mistakes in there. Um, and when I say mistakes, I don't just mean like different ways than they were played, I mean actual mistakes. So one has to be very careful about the printed music that you are looking at. The printed music should always take a back seat to definitive recordings. And ultimately, if you've got the ability to listen to lots and lots of recordings and analyze them and transcribe them, making your own chart out of what was played is sometimes the best. But um, if you're gonna use an actual chart, it's good to go with something that is in the realm of like a legal real book or something that an expert has written out for you. Um, the, as I say, there are lots of mistakes in the old books that's very, very well known. Um, iReal Pro, for example, has some some really, really great things. Some of it is really, really accurate and some of it is like, you know, a little bit gray. And that's kind of par for the course because any chart, no matter how good it is, is really gonna be an amalgam of different ways that the song was played. It's not the original sheet music. And even the original sheet music was oftentimes wrong. I mean, you had publishing houses that were just churning out charts left and right. And of course there's bound to be mistakes. So while you may find a little bit more accuracy as to what the composer intended with the oldest version of a sheet of sheet music, it still might not be what they intended and certainly won't be usually what Miles Davis played in the 1950s on If I Were a Bell, right? So there's a lot of gray area. And so know that charts are really almost in a sense suggestions um, and that you should always be willing to make changes to them. You know, having a pencil handy or an Apple pencil is handy uh, to make changes as you listen and transcribe and as you learn from, as I say, experts that are correcting common mistakes. Um, Adam and Peter Martin at uh, Open Studio are commonly doing this. They're doing short videos where they're saying, hey, these are actually the correct changes to XYZ tune. So listen to experts like that and try to incorporate that into your own playing. Be listening for those little specific differences. If something is a minor six on the original recording, but on the chart it says minor seven, that's a big difference. And we should try to pay attention to things like that. So as far as actually learning the tunes, as always, there's no fast answer and listening is your most important tool. So you've gotta be familiar with what the song actually sounds like, right? And repeated listening to multiple versions is very, very helpful. You wanna to try to learn by ear first if you can. S figure out the form, uh, figure out the melody, figure out the lyrics, uh, figure out the chords if you can, figure out playing the melody on your instrument, and so on. Do the best you can. It's not necessarily a whole transcription exercise, but really getting inside it with your ear first is gonna give you a lot of a sort of good foot forward as you go on to really get it inside your system. So once you've spent some time learning it by ear, then check the printed music and note any differences. Um, you can not just write them in, but also you know notice them <laughs> and think about it. And especially if you listen to multiple versions, it makes a lot of sense to me to actually write in the way that Dizzy played such and so, you know, Dizzy played this tune this way and Art Tatum played the same tune this way and I would write in the specific chord changes that they used in this particular measure so that I can sort of have reference for when I'm playing with someone else and they want to play Dizzy's version, I know what those alternate changes are from what's in the chart. But very, very importantly, when you are thinking about the harmonic progression or looking at the chart, looking at the harmonic progression, Analyze it in really big chunks. You wanna distill the song into its most basic elements if you can. 
Where you can recognize two fives, where you can recognize big movements, like the whole A section is in this key and the bridge goes to this other key. Like grabbing onto that and recognizing that will make a humongous difference in allowing you to retain what you're learning. Because you're not thinking about every little minuscule flat nine and sharp nine. You're thinking much bigger and that's gonna allow you to process it. It's really hard to just memorize a lot of tiny details as opposed to obviously big sort of picture things. So really be looking at harmonic analysis and spend some time thinking about, oh, this first four measures as actually just, you know, uh, um, uh, setting up what happens in the next four, which is just sort of a repetition of that, but up a fourth or something like that. So you're, you're really sort of trying to grab the, the, the broad picture of the tune. And that's what you're sort of latching onto. You're laying that as the foundation of remembering. And then as you go, you're adding those little elements on top. Oh, right. This is a flat five on this chord and so on and so forth. But don't try to grab all that at first. Grab the big part. So once you do that, you want to drill this tune with the recording and using your ears as soon as possible. So I, you've got your recording that you've been listening to. Play along with the chart. Play along with it. Look at what's happening and really try to just drill it and get it in your head and try to look away from the paper as soon as you can. As soon as possible, just be using your ears and just go over it again and again and again as many times as necessary. It may take a couple days to do so, and that's okay. You're really only working on one song at a time. It shouldn't be too overwhelming. So once you get one version down, which may take a couple days, try to do it in a different key. As I say, American songbooks, done a bunch of different ways. Vocalists sing them. They usually sing in different keys. So putting the tune in a different key, playing the melody in a different key, it really, really help to sem uh, really, really help to cement that into your ears and into your mind. And then remembering. So we've learned a tune and now we need to remember it, right? That's usually sort of the trickiest part. And here's where I think the secret sauce of this sort of system is, and that is to consciously devote time in your practice schedule to actually reviewing the tunes that you know. So you've got this assembled list of tunes that you know, you've got this assembled binder of tunes that you know. So devote 30 minutes or 15 minutes, however much time you spend learning a tune, spend the same amount of time reviewing the tunes and go one at a time. Start at the beginning, spend 15 minutes going from tune to tune and try not to, to use the charts, but if you need to look at them, they're there to reinforce it and just sort of buzz through them. Play a couple choruses, play one chorus if you know really well, and go on to the next one. When you're done with the 15 minutes, on the next day, pick up where you left off, reviewing those tunes. And so that really helps to reinforce what you learned, obviously the day before, but as you get further and further along learning more tunes, you need to reinforce what you learned, you know, a year ago. So just keep cycling through as you go through the list, just when you get to the end of the binder, start again at the beginning on the next practice session. So, I mean, it may take you a month to get through the whole binder, but the point is you keep just reinforcing that, keep touching on those tunes you already learned. And it's really no more than that. It's pretty, pretty simple basically. But the idea that I think a lot of folks maybe don't spend time with is, you know, reviewing these things in an organized sort of logical way. And so it doesn't require a whole lot of effort other than sort of just thinking ahead and spending a little time to put things in a way that is really accessible to you. Because when you sit down to practice, when you stand to practice for us, when you are practicing, you want to be able to access this stuff really quickly. So on my iPad, I've got that PDF of all the tunes I know. I've got an accompanying playlist that I'm able to hit play on. And boom, I just go for however much time to remember the tunes. I say, And I say, oh yeah, I forgot about this tune. I forgot how this goes. And you may discover something you completely forgot and you got to spend more time on it. That's fine. But doing these things together being able to be organized and devoting your time to learning this stuff will really help to increase your repertoire and to really make sure that it is part of you. Because when you go to the gig, when you go to the jam session, the more you feel confident about what you know, the less pressure you feel when somebody asks you to play something that you don't know. If you've, you know, if they ask you a, a tune you don't know, that is a waltz, for example, you may say, ah, I haven't learned that yet, but how about we play this waltz that you learned that you like? And more than likely people will agree with that. So I hope that the simple talk was helpful for you today. Look for that PDF below, like, subscribe, and always remember, straight ahead and strive for tone.